Emily, thank you for, for joining me here in Bungie Library. Yep. Um, we're at the end of November 2021 and you know, just thank you for, for, for getting together so that we can talk about um, the perimenopause hub yep. and about women's journey through the menopause yeah, that's fun. And and from the perimenopause to the menopause to postmenopause. I mean that that's and can be a very long journey, I think, for people, which I don't claim to know a huge amount about, although um, just within family I've got a little bit of experience just from, from the journey my wife's going through. So could you just tell us how you came, if you're happy to tell me how you came to set up the perimenopause hub mm -hmm. and, and let's please explore this subject. Okay, um, so I started getting symptoms of perimenopause when I was 39, so I was deemed to be too young um, and it was very marked because I'd gone from training for Ironman triathlon, so I was the fittest I've ever been, to four months later exhausted, gain weight, angry, Ooh, the anger was quite something. Um, and I went backwards and forwards to the doctors. I actually cal I worked this all out a, a while ago. 13 different trips to the doctor mm. over three and a half years. And I was told I was too stressed. I was told I was depressed. I was told I should exercise more and sleep better. Um, and it just, I kept not getting answers and not getting answers. And eventually, after we'd done yet more blood tests, but the blood tests are um, notorious for not being very reliable when it comes to hormones because the hormones are fluctuating so much. Um, the doctor and I sat down and we agreed that it was one of two things. One thing being perimenopause and the other thing being chronic fatigue. But by this point, geek that I am, I'd been tracking everything and I'd put it, and the tracking app that I use doesn't have the option to pull out the data in the free version and I'm, I'm far too cheap to, <laughs> to pay for the paid version. Um, so I'd pulled all the data out into Excel and you know, made graphs mm -hmm. and, yeah. so that I could understand what was going on. And it was very, very clear that everything was happening with my cycle. So the fatigue was worse at certain times. All the other bits and pieces were very, it was very obvious once I looked at the, looked at the data. So when I then went and talk, spoke to the doctor and we said that it was either chronic fatigue or it was perimenopause, I was pretty certain that because there was this cyclical aspect that it was hormonal rather than mm -hmm. just, I say just, I mean there's no just about chronic fatigue at all and I know that, but it wasn't fatigue, it was all sorts Absolutely. of stuff. Sure, sure. Um, and coming away from that appointment I felt like a weight had lifted because I had a word. Yes. And there's a word that gives you something to Google, doesn't it? You're not, you're not like at death's door or whatever, which as anybody who's taken a long time to get any sort of diagnosis will know, you, you go, you go to some pretty dark places mm -hmm. in your head. Um, so I came home and looked to see what sort of support things I could find, what information I could find. And most things that I was finding online were aimed at menopause, so at women whose periods had finished. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, the women in these groups were in their 50s. I was still by this point 42. I didn't mm -hmm. feel like I belonged there yet. You know, people were talking about their grandchildren. They were talking about um, the plans for the, the last few years before retirement. A very different sure. setup to when you're in your early 40s. And, um, and I also noticed that a lot of the groups were run by a specific practitioner who had their method of dealing with the symptoms and managing them. But they, I couldn't find anywhere that offered an array of different modalities, different experts, different ways to help people. Sure. And, and I know from personal experience of, you know, on one day when my hormones are all happy, I might want to do things by changing my, my nutrition. On days when my um, hormones aren't happy, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that. You know, I want duvets, and, and I might want some gentle yoga or whatever. You know, so it occurred to me that actually, by bringing together experts in lots of different um, fields, I could offer more help 
to women going through this than just the medical route or just any one particular route. So um, that's really how the hub idea came about. Sure. Um, and then perimenopausehub.com was available, so that was a sign that yes. obviously this was meant to happen. Um, so then I started bringing together some experts and I decided to kind of um, label them, I don't like labeling things, but it made sense for my brain to have compartmentalized things. So we have um, medical hub, obviously, mm -hmm. um, then there's nutrition, fitness, holistic and acceptance. And for me, I think the most important one is acceptance because a lot of women, and I see this day in, day out in the Facebook group that we have, a lot of women hit perimenopause, have no idea what's going on, have this horrible feeling that they're suddenly old, they're suddenly invisible, they're suddenly frumpy, they're suddenly all, all manner of nasty words. And, and that actually getting, getting to a point when you go, okay, cool, this is still me. It's just a slightly different version of me, just as, you know, 10 year old me wasn't the same as 18 year old sure. me because puberty had happened. So 40 year old me won't be the same as 55 year old me because menopause will have happened. Sure. But I'm still in essence me. Yeah. And actually with that acceptance side of things, I, it helps people to think, okay, cool, right. Bring on the rest of my life. I've got this rather than Oh my goodness, this is this is an end of some sort. I suppose one of the difficult things seems to be just how long and how <laughs> unknown, how unknown it is. You know, whether there are so many different parts to explore, aren't there? That's what I feel. When I read about it and when I talk to people, you mentioned um, being thirty nine, I think. Yeah. And I think I was reading that so for about one in a hundred women, it will be under the age of 40 when their menopause when they, starts, when there's an yeah. early menopause, which is quite a lot, isn't it? It's, yeah. not, it's not like one in 10,000. No. And, and so it must come as, as a complete shock and completely understandable why someone would not immediately think, well, it, it's obviously the menopause sort of yeah. journey starting. Um, and that perimenopause for some people lasts for, for, you've said for you it's lasted for years. Yeah. But again, it must be very hard to, because it's such an unknown quantity and it affects people so differently, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think that's something that's probably mm. worth me just outlining here. So menopause itself is when it, it gets used as the umbrella term sure. for the whole thing, but it's actually defined retrospectively when a woman has gone 12 months without a period. So, and the average age to get to that is 51 in the UK. Perimenopause is the time before that when things are changing. So, again, if we liken it to puberty, you know, a girl goes through puberty for, let's say, 10 years, but her periods only start once. You know, they, yeah. they, they can't start yeah. over and over. Yeah. And in the same way, when we get to the menopause end of things, there's the whole fluctuation, all the things changing, but there's still that one defining day of menopause. Yes. So perimenopause is the time from when everything has been normal and it starts changing until that magic day and thereafter is postmenopause. I always think it's worth just getting that clear. Yes, yes. So that we we know what terms we're dealing with. And someone and and I know that it's it's quite possible to go for 11 months without a period yes. and then for a period new <laughs> and and, and the person think I'm I'm I'm, I'm there. surely there. I'm I'm surely this is I'm over the over that sort of milestone of actually reaching my period to have stopped for twelve months and yep. yet and it's about the levels of estrogen hormone, is that right? So this is um right, so the two hormones we're mainly talking about are estrogen and progesterone. Right. At the start of perimenopause, progesterone tends to stop to start dropping quite in quite a linear fashion, whilst estrogen is just having a field day, frankly. Mm -hmm. And this is often where perimenopause in the early stages doesn't get spotted because that, that, that sort of subtle decline of progesterone at the start can lead to, to symptoms that aren't necessarily joined up. Mm -hmm. Things like anxiety and low mood and more of the psychological symptoms whereas the stereotypical symptoms of menopause are the hot flushes and the irregular periods. 
And that's where it can be very difficult when we're talking about perimenopause, certainly for, for doctors and, and healthcare providers to, to spot it because it may well manifest as something that seems just to be, I say again, just, I don't mean just in that respect, mm. but seems to be pertaining to a mental health issue or a psychological issue when actually the underlying cause is the hormones changing. Mm. But often it's quite difficult to join those dots if we don't see that there's this cyclical aspect, but generally, and again, this is a bit of a generalization, but if a woman is experiencing new anxiety that is cyclical with her monthly cycle, it is, there is a chance that it will be hormonal, sure. and ideally that would be looked into. Whereas anxiety, again, like with the fatigue, as I described it for me, yes. You know, if it's a, a more more constant state, it's probably that. But if it's very clearly going with the cycle, ideally we'd start looking at whether there's a hormonal thing underlying it. Mm. And you mentioned the kind of, can I say, mood swings, or the <laughs> feelings of sort of anger and, and all of that kind of emotional um, <laughs> yes. impact. I mean, that's obviously going to affect the person themselves completely. And those around them in work, in home, in friends who might go, whoa, <laughs> what, what, what's it's, going on here? It's um, really scary. I mean, I, I, I'm not a particularly angry person. I'm, I'm pretty happy normally. I have had a few instances where the rage has, I felt like an out of body experience. Like, I'm watching this incredibly angry version of myself, and my poor partner, just I'm going back in, and another thing, and this, and then you didn't do that. And I don't even know where this rage is coming from. And as I say, it's like I'm watching this horrible, angry version of me just saying all those things that normally you just wouldn't, because A, because you don't actually think it necessarily. Or, or, or maybe it's something that has very slightly niggled you, but it isn't enough to be angry about. It's something that maybe, under normal circumstances, you go, do you know what, that makes me feel a bit rubbish if you do that. But it doesn't need all the sort of um, pomp and ceremony. And my experience of it as well was then the rage passes, and then there's just this, about an hour of just sobbing, because it's obviously just triggered all these emotions and I have, I have then found on the particularly bad ones that I feel almost hung over for a few days after it and it's it's really horrible yeah. it's, it's a really all-encompassing thing it's not just feeling a bit irritated and trying to describe that to when you when you talk about it anybody watching this who has experienced that will be nodding right now 100% they'll mm -hmm. be going yeah it is it's like an out of and oh my goodness but anybody who hasn't experienced it will just think it's a bit angry. Mm. And it's so much more than just a bit angry. It, it is all consuming. In the time when it is happening, you, you, it's, it's terrifying how little control you have. But again, going back to what I've said about tracking everything, I've now learned what my triggers are. Mm. Not the specific triggers, but what it feels like in me. It's like, when it's starting, oh, yeah. the angry person's there today. Okay. I'm just going to go and sit over here and keep myself to myself mm. and keep my blood sugar level. Because for me, <laughs> if I get a sort of, and I'm not, I'm not diabetic or anything like that, but if I, if I can feel the blood sugar levels dropping and I'm in the angry phase, <laughs> won't betide anybody else. You're fine me. at the moment. Absolutely <laughs> fine. <laughs> and I've just had lunch, so you're fine. <laughs> so I make light of it, but it's not at all something to make light of. And I think the other... Another symptom that people seem to have just no control over is that flush of heat. Absolutely. And and people might think that that's just kind of a hot flush, but, but it's beyond, way beyond a hot flush, isn't it? Yeah, and again, it's one that, you know, the, the overarching perception of menopause is that it's women in their 50s and they're, they're a bit hot. <laughs> and then you sort of go, oh, oh, it's so much more than that. But I, 
I am yet to experience a hot flush, so I will. I I can't speak from first hand experience of what they're like, but I I know from speaking to a lot of people that, for some, it feels like this furnace inside them, and then they're just sweating all over the place, and then it dies down. Others feel really faint and dizzy as it comes on. Others feel like it comes with an anxiety attack, with a panic attack. So there's even just the the stereotypical hot flush doesn't manifest in a a linear way for, for all people, you know, so... I know there are nights when, on my side of the bed, just sharing here, there's a <laughs> duvet and a, and a kind of and a, and a, and a fleece blanket and the temperature's like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like last night, it's like mm -hmm. zero, it's like minus something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and then on my wife's side of the bed, there's a sheet, and that's yes. it, because she is so hot that yes. basically she doesn't need anything, she doesn't want anything else, no. because that's enough, a sheet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. And if you if you look into the, the the night sweats are slightly different to the hot flushes. They manifest in a very similar way, but they um, they are actually coming from slightly different sources and could be managed in slightly different ways. I won't go into the, I won't bore you with that right now. But things like what we're eating and what we're doing and and what we drink, whether we drink caffeine, whether mm. we drink alcohol, and they can all affect night sweats, but also hot flushes. But a lot of people find that different things trigger. It's not just one thing triggers heat. It's that some things will trigger hot flushes and other things might trigger night sweats. So when people are looking for, initially I suppose, to answer the question, so am I now in the perimenopause or not? Um, and they're going to their GP. I noticed you've got a link on your Facebook page, I think on your website too, to the British Menopause Society's map of yeah. where the clinics are, um, both NHS and private. So you put in your postcode and it just flags them all up on a mm -hmm. map and gives you the details. Are there many clinics? For, I mean, my wife went, what clinic? I didn't know there was a clinic. <laughs> I mean, going to see my GP, didn't mention a clinic. So right. uh, is there kind of one per county? Or? <sighs> I don't think there's even that much. I, no. I believe we have one at the Norfolk and Norwich. Right. I don't know anyone who's been referred there. Right, right. <laughs> um, it's, it's really difficult because um, the NICE guidelines state that in any woman over 45, symptoms should be taken as the way of determining mm. whether somebody is in perimenopause. But as I've already said, I started getting symptoms at 39 and I am not unusual in that. Mm -hmm. And I think this is actually quite a, a difficult area because GPs aren't taught enough about it. Um, and so joining the dots doesn't happen. And worryingly, I <laughs> speaking to somebody the other day, even with private health insurance, mm -hmm. they won't refer you to a menopause specialist. They will refer you to an anxiety clinic and then to a sleep clinic and then and then rather so than looking just at the symptoms and referring rather than joining the dots and going oh let's look at the hormones and yeah. and that seems to be across the board so whether that's in the NHS side of things or whether that's in the private side of things there doesn't really seem to be the joined up thinking of going okay a person in this age category is presenting with these a selection of these symptoms mm -hmm. Let's rule out other things and then focus on this. Now, don't get me wrong, we always need to rule out other things because it can be thyroid um, issues can mm -hmm. present some of the same symptoms. Certain vitamin deficiencies can do as well. Um, and there are various other things that can cover off similar things. But they tend to be things that you can run diagnostic tests on mm -hmm. and voila, jobs are good and you know what you're dealing with and you can treat accordingly. Yes. Um, the blood tests in um, de um, determining perimenopause are unreliable to say the best, to say the least, because our hormones are doing all sorts of crazy fun stuff. Um, so ideally the blood tests would be used to rule out other things and then we would look at the symptoms together and say, okay, these things are happening, they're happening cyclically. And I actually, I do always advise that any woman before going to her doctor about it starts tracking so that actually when you go you can say okay these things are all happening but i've noticed that they're happening 
around my cycle like this, sure. rather than, as I did <laughs> when I had no idea what was happening, turning up with a post-it note and going, these things are happening. Okay. Can you help? And, and your poor you doctor's the sitting track. there in like 10 minutes going, yes. uh, no, actually I can't. Did you mention an online tracker that you were using that has yes. sort of a free version, a paid version? So I, I use one called Clue app. Okay. There are other ones. Um, there's one called P Tracker. There's another one called Flow. And then Dr. Louise Newsom, who, do, who who's the big name in menopause stuff, she has recently, recently launched one called Balance app, which is specifically aimed at perimenopause and menopause. Um, but Clue works for me, and so that's that's the one I've stuck with because, sure. as with all these things, you know, you get used to it, don't you? Well, yes, I know what I'm doing. Done. You know how to do it. Yeah. But yeah. I, I do, I do, um, <laughs> I bleat on about it a lot, about encouraging people to to track because actually the more that we get to know what our body is doing at each point in our cycle, the more we can see when it's different, okay. and therefore the more we're turning up to the doctor armed with some information to actually help them to help us, rather than just going, I don't know, help me. And they go, where do we start? Exactly. <clears throat> exactly. Do you think quite a lot of women are prescribed antidepressants and, and basically when they're treating the symptoms, they're referring on perhaps to a chronic fatigue syndrome um, service, or you, I think you mentioned that that, 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 that perhaps yeah. isn't uncommon. It's not uncommon at all, unfortunately. Um, and, and I completely understand why, because we, we present with the, symptom that, the symptoms that are upsetting us the most, rather than looking at the whole picture. And if we haven't looked at the whole picture, mm. no one else can. Um, yeah. And I think it's, I, I, you know, I, I strongly believe that, I'm gonna try not to go into one of my little feminist rants here. <laughs> bear with this could go wrong um, as girls we are then told that you know this will happen and then we must just sort of despite having these cycles we must live in a predominantly male run world and so we must we must be the same every day and we present to work the same every day and, and even if we're having a really bad day because it is that time in our cycle when we will be having a bad day we must present as though we're still the same I would I would encourage any teenage girl to start tracking from day one basically so that she gets to know when her good days are and her bad days um, but the more we ignore that because we try to fit into a, a world in which we have to present in the same way every day the more we're denying ourselves the chance to know our own body our own cycle our own moods our own energy levels our own food cravings, all of those things that are happening differently. Not, you know, differently every single day, but throughout sure. each cycle, there are distinct patterns. And the more we get to know those patterns, the more we can say, ah, oh, that was unusual for me. Right. That's normal for me. Okay, that's normal for me, right? Good, life's going on as normal. And I see this a lot, that a lot of women will start to track their cycle when they want to get pregnant so they'll suddenly start going oh I need to know when I ovulate so I need to know that okay I'm going to focus on that but that's ignoring all the other days and all the other little clues and all the other little bits of information that your body's giving every single day every single minute so as I said you know I've started to know what the the angry feeling is and I know exactly when it comes and when I feel it I'm like oh okay about two days out from the period there we are good but I know that's coming and therefore that's fine. As opposed to thinking, I am angry, but I don't know why. Mm. Um, and I think that's such a superpower that we, that we all have available to us as women. Um, and that a lot of us just don't, don't tap into it. And I suppose if you're not tapping into that, then you're not <clears throat> able to explain at work why you're a bit more short tempered than yes. you might have expected today. Exactly. Know, and for and people to go, okay, fair enough. And, and when you, allow some tolerance, really, isn't it? And when you translate it to the workplace, you know, whether, whether someone's in their 20s, their 30s, or, you know, classically in the age of going through perimenopause, there will be days when they are absolutely epic, when you can take on doing all of the presentations, and hmm. I'll go and do the sales pitch, yeah, I've got this. And then there'll be a couple of days when it's like, 
I'm best off just, you know, staying behind this. I'll do emails today, thanks. And there's nothing wrong with that. And this is the thing, I think, I think it's become this perception that we ought to be exactly the same every day, and we're not, you know. I suppose you can't even say, well, actually, for the women who have been through the perimenopause, reached menopause, and are now post-menopause, because everyone's experience is so different, one might, you know, I might think, well, they, they'll understand best, but I suppose it depends what their experience was as to whether they're then um, going to sort of appreciate what someone else might be going through. Absolutely, and I mean, I think if you, if you translate it, if you compare it to, you know, any other thing, so if you compare it to mental health, you know, anybody who has experienced depression will have an understanding of what depression was like for them. Sure. But not necessarily what it was like for anybody no, else. Not at all. You know, and yes, they might use exactly the same terms. The same goes for pain. The same goes for a cough. The same goes for anything. You, you can only actually experience it for how you do. Mm. And what I'm constantly trying to do is just raise that awareness so that people just momentarily think and go, oh, just because my experience was that, maybe this other person is having a worse time than me, or maybe they're having a better time than me. Mm. But maybe we could talk about it maybe we could Absolutely. communicate about it maybe we could just meet each other in the middle with kindness and go okay are you having that day shall I bring cake and just just be nice I know it's a lovely idea <laughs> no but it's so true and, and, and so the perimenopause hub you'll, mm -hmm. you'll have the website perimenopausehub.com yep. yep. and on Facebook um, there is a group which yep. is perimenopause hub um, which ticked over 30,000 members last night, wow. which is just yeah. crazy. Yeah. And then there's also a page, which is Perimenopause Hub Official. And I suppose, and you're on Twitter and Instagram and Twitter too, and Instagram. And I, but I suppose if you've got a group of that size, then there's every chance that if someone says, I'm experiencing this, <clears throat> there's going to be other people in a group of that size who go, been there, and I'm yeah. still there, or being yeah. there, and this is what's helping me, which is a huge resource, isn't it? A yeah. huge, valuable resource. And the group's lovely for that, because because I've got the, the experts, then the experts can hop in and say, well, actually, from the herbal medicine point of view, this will help you, sure. or from the <coughs> exercise point of view, have you tried this? But you've also got that peer support to say, yes, yes, that happened to me. Oh, my God, I didn't think, I thought I was mm. losing it, or mm. I thought I was, you know... I thought I was the only one who felt like this and you know every day we get new members joining going oh my god I'm not alone anymore mm. I just think I mean I'm incredibly proud that it's growing I'm incredibly proud that it's doing well but I'm I'm so saddened that it needs to exist because mm. it shouldn't need to because we should be being heard anyway for the younger woman who's yep. starting to go on that journey I think there's a network, and I saw the link on the website, it's Daisy... Daisy Network, Daisy so that Network. is for um, premature ovarian insufficiency, POI, which is early, which is a young menopause. Under so, so under age of 40 <coughs> of having reached menopause, so perimenopause can start early, but, yeah. but you can, it's still not POI unless your periods stop oh, really? early. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> um, and Daisy Network are brilliant for... For supporting those women it's just useful perhaps to yeah absolutely this is yes i mean we the youngest the youngest person i know was 14 wow. when she all, all done and presumably there are other you know if someone has a hysterectomy if they have yeah. surgery for cancer there are other reasons i suppose why they might stop having periods and might that would then be yeah. the menopause and yeah. might get some of those and i think that can be quite a strong effect then is that right Absolutely. So if somebody has a surgical menopause, so they have a hysterectomy and um, oophorectomy, I've never said that, word, but that's having your ovaries taken out as well. So if, if somebody just has their uterus removed, it shouldn't affect their hormones too much. If their ovaries are taken out, then that will immediately straight into a surgical menopause. And um, at that point, unless there are very strong reasons why the person can't have um, HRT, the best thing for them is to have mm. oestrogen to replace what their ovaries would be um, offering. In the case of certain cancers, there will be 
some women who can't access that and if that person has also had to have um, the hysterectomy and the oophorectomy then yeah that's not a nice that's not mm. a nice state of affairs and that takes a lot of managing that's helpful actually because you've mentioned HRT we, yeah. we haven't talked so far about HRT and obviously I think most people if they think of menopause that will that will come into their mind so could you just tell us a little bit more about hormone mm -hmm. replacement therapy yep so HRT um, replaces the hormones that are depleting mm -hmm. um, generally estrogen and progesterone if um, if somebody has had a hysterectomy they won't need the progesterone part I'm speaking very generally here because there are always those instances where this isn't the case but the progesterone part is to protect the uterus and so in somebody who doesn't have a uterus they would only need the estrogen um, and HRT can be taken in tablet form in gels in patches mm. in sprays um, and depending on where the person is in the whole journey they, they will need different types so there's there's cyclical um, HRT which means that you have estrogen every day and progesterone for half the month to replicate the cycle of still having periods and then there is continuous which is what somebody would go on to once they've reached menopause which is estrogen and progesterone every day again there are always those um, situations where those don't follow but if, so if somebody is using a marina coil, which could be used as contraception as well, then they could, that, that provides their progesterone okay. constantly. So they would go on to a continuous, but they're not on a continuous because they haven't yet reached menopause necessarily. But in very simple terms, if you still have um, your uterus, you need progesterone and estrogen. If you still have periods, you need that cyclically. If you have stopped your periods, you need it con continuously. Did I... Am I right in thinking that I saw an article where someone, perhaps a member of parliament, was campaigning for HRT to be um, provided free? Yeah. At the moment, is it a prescription? It's two prescriptions. Two prescriptions. Yes. And, and I seem to recall it was actually quite expensive because of the amount of prescription needed yeah. for someone to be paying for that, quite significantly expensive. Um, What's people's general experience? Do they find that the GPs generally say, well, let's explore that as an option, or do they find that's not usually put forward as an option, or is it just totally varied? It's really varied. Um, I suspect what I see in the people I work with in the, in the group and everything like that, mm. I suspect I see a skewed version of this, okay. insofar as people don't tend to shout about the positive experience, they tend to shout about the negative experience. But I am seeing an awful lot of women who are not being offered HRT when that would be the thing that would help them. And going back to the NICE guidelines, as I said, that states that in a woman over 45, presenting with the symptoms of perimenopause, menopause, that HRT should be the first thing to be looked at. Um, but a lot of women are still finding they're being given antidepressants mm. or just being told to go and read around it. And so find do you think there are a lot of women who will realise that because their periods are not happening on a regular basis and, and they are approaching or in their 50s are thinking, this is, I am going through the menopause, I'm yeah. menopausal, and they just soldier on. Yeah. Do you think that's, the, is that the norm, do you think? And, and some people get very few symptoms, and so soldiering on is absolutely fine. Um, and then some people get absolutely debilitating symptoms mm. and are sometimes treated as though they are the people who have lesser symptoms, and that's, that's where I think it becomes difficult. I suppose and one of the hard things is if you are having a lot of symptoms, you may not necessarily have the energy left over to do something about it. In fact, soldiering on is the kind of default way of getting through the day and then becomes the usual pattern and yeah. so you, you kind of just dealing with each day at a time even though that's turned into a year and then perhaps another year yeah. um, so what would make what would help do you 
something. Gosh, that's a big question. It's like, <laughs> people would have a magic wand time. So there's a magic wand. What right. would you do if I gave you a magic wand and you could wave it? What would you do? With my magic wand, yes. I would improve menopause education at medical school mm -hmm. because that would then knock down. That would that would filter down to everybody. But I would also. I'm going to have a two -tier, two pronged attack here. I would make the knowledge about perimenopause so much more widely available so that women don't have this massive slap around the face as I had when it hit, when it hits them so that they know it's coming because actually with those two things with us everyday women knowing that this is going to happen and that actually it isn't puberty pregnancy menopause and no kind of transitioning time there if we all knew that and then if the medical community had better education around it and frankly the medical it's it isn't a standard thing that is particularly taught mm. at medical school it is um, um, I can't think what the word is that I want well I guess one of very very many things that they absolutely to include in, in absolutely the education. oh absolutely and I'm not yeah. I'm not for a second um, you know this is this is not a slight on on doctors or anybody mm -hmm. like that at all god but I do find it interesting yeah. that when we think about the fact that half the population will go through Absolutely. this, yeah. I feel it should be better taught, certainly for GPs, because they're going to be mm. the people who see it first. Mm. Um, you know, it, we aren't talking about some rare condition that all. only a neurologist no, will need to know about or whatever. We're talking about something that, you know, 51% of the population will go through. Not all will have symptoms, not all will need to see their doctor about it, but all those who do need to see their doctor should be being taken seriously when they get there. Is there and really because research about how many women as a proportion do have symptoms? I just wonder. Not don't that I have off the top of my no, head. No. Um, just curious. There probably is, but I don't have that, no, no, <laughs> that no, information off the top of my head. Sorry to me. Um, but no, I think. I think it's, and, and, and this is, again, I'm, I'm harping back to tracking again, but this is where I think each woman can actually take control of what's going on to her by understanding what's going on by tracking, so that then when she does go to see the doctor, they're already meeting halfway. She's mm -hmm. not just turning up and going, I mean, seriously, I don't know what's going on. But I think on the flip side, if, we, if there were better education around it, and it, because at the moment it's very, very much a specialism that a, a GP will choose to go and learn about as opposed to something that is taught in any great depth to everybody um, then I think it would be it would be flagged up more quickly mm. with those two things with better understanding on the part of the doctors and better understanding on the part of the individual we could not have people having 13 plus appointments before mm. they get anywhere and wasting a huge amount of resource. Mm. Yes. You know, yes. aside from take, taking out of the equation the individual person's frustrations that it's taking a long time, it's frankly a waste, it's a drain on the NHS that we're not Oh, the leaflets. Getting there quickly. We're in Bungie Library. As I walked in, I was looking at the leaflet stand, and there's leaflets about getting help around cancer, all all sorts of things. And I just looked and went, "Is there one about the minerals?" There's a notice saying free sanitary products here. Um, Good. And I think that applies across Suffolk libraries. But I didn't see any information you could pick up and go. I wonder if that will help me. It's, yeah. it's interesting that that isn't perhaps as readily available as it might be, just kind of amongst the other information that's. That's, um, and I think that, that I think that that comes into the fact there's still a taboo around it as well. And yet, you know, you, I was just thinking. So there's there's over seven hundred thousand people in Suffolk. Yeah. So there's over three hundred there's over three hundred and fifty thousand people in Suffolk who have gone through the menopause or one or day will. will. Do. Mm -hmm. That's that's a lot of people, isn't it? That's a lot of people. <laughs> um, and that's only Suffolk. You know. And that is only Suffolk, yes, yes. And you look, thank you very much, thank you. Um, I've learnt a lot, <laughs> and I hope that us having this conversation will help take that, those messages and that information, and just share it with a, with a wider audience again. 
um, yeah. which is all we really want to do is just help get get the information out there. If people want to find and uh, uh, more about the perimenopause hub, they can find that online at perimenopausehub.com. Yeah. And I think the email is info at perimenopausehub.com. Yes. So, yeah, um, and we'll certainly share that alongside the sort of film at the start and finish. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me that opportunity. Um, so, thank you very much. Thank you.